Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, webinar, which is all about how to use various activities in the classroom to foster understanding of our cultures and languages. I'm Rabia Rashid, your moderator for tonight with my partner, Laura, as admin support. Tonight's webinar will uh, present, the, uh, present all of us with definitions of culture awareness and intercultural competence, as well as their importance of the for the language classroom. It will also provide the benefits of infusing lessons with intercultural components. Uh, it has a showcase of possible lessons that can be implemented in any ESL classroom context. And this webinar will highlight some resources for educators. And uh, today's webinar is presented by Yesid, who is a PhD student in the program of Languages and Literacies and Comparative International Development Education at OISE at University of Toronto with a vast international teacher training experience. He is interested in language teacher education and how social justice juxtaposes with concepts of plurilingualism in different TESOL uh, national and international contexts. All right, thank you very much. Can you hear me well now again? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ravia, and everybody at uh, Tesla Ontario for this invitation. This is such a great opportunity to, to have these conversations among many people. Um, first of all, I hope to spark curiosity for cultural inclusion in the classroom. I will present today concepts and ideas as possibilities for adaptation, depending on your context and classroom environment. I also understand that there are topics that cannot be addressed in certain contexts as well. And I encourage you to exercise caution to address these topics. Like I said, <clears throat> I don't consider myself an expert necessarily in these topics, but mainly a person who wants brings these topics uh, on the floor for teachers, educators, researchers, etc., just to discuss and start uh, doing things on your own. So let's see. Uh, so this is our tentative agenda for today. So I will be discussing what is cultural or intercultural awareness, what is intercultural competence, and we'll be talking about classroom possibilities. I will give you a specific example of a lesson plan that, that, that I'm suggesting, and then we'll be finishing with some questions. Uh, yes, Ed, I'm yes, sorry, yes, I'm going to interrupt yes. you here. Uh, could you turn on your camera? Oh, uh, okay. Let me double check. Can I? I didn't know I could do that, but can I try? Yeah, it's on the top, uh, on the yes. top of the screen. You see the at the top of the screen. Yes, I'm trying. You see the red telephone thing. Okay. And on the right hand side, there is a camera button, webcam. See. Okay. Oh yes, we see you now. Thank you very much. All right, this is great. Thank you so much. I didn't know I was able to do this, but this is great. <clears throat> okay. So let's go on. So this is our agenda for today. Um, so the first question that I'm going to ask for you guys today is this one, right? Before starting our presentation, I would like to ask you this question in order to understand whether we have to live in other countries or not to understand their culture. So we have a few moments here to see how many people tonight have lived in other countries other than the one you were born and as we can see pretty much a lot of people here have lived in different countries 77 percent mainly have lived in other countries so um does does this mean that you are allowed or not allowed to teach culture or talk about these issues in the classroom, definitely that 23% of the people here today, right? It doesn't mean that you can, you are not allowed to talk about these issues. So that's the exercise with these uh, slide questions today. It means that everybody gets the chance to discuss these issues in the classroom. So now uh, we have another question here, which is, uh, can you comment uh, on any funny or embarrassing cultural experience on the chat box? 
And while you guys are doing so, I'm going to give you one minute. And in the meantime, uh, I'm going to give you my experience or my cultural experience when I went to Argentina a few years ago. Then I noticed that the guys, the, man, the men, would kiss each other on the, on the cheeks you know, when they were greeting to each other. And this is something for me that it was very, very awkward because in Colombia, at least uh, in, the, in the cultures that, or in the context that I was uh, living with, uh, there is not very common that two men would kiss on the cheek when they greet. It was usually me, women and women or men and women, but definitely not men or men. And when I went to Argentina, it was difficult and uh, a little bit difficult and hard for me to understand this as part of the culture. It took me a couple of days to understand this. But eventually I got used to it, and then I was the one who was initiating <coughs> kissing the, the other men on the cheek uh, as greetings. I guess nobody has uh, made any comment on the chat box, so I guess not many people have these embarrassing or cultural experiences on uh, uh, when you guys travel or, or any other ones. But uh, I guess with what I'm trying to say here uh, in this example is that. Um, when what, ha what happened to me with these experiences from that experience on, I learned that when Argent or when I was, you know, hanging out with Argentinians, I would behave in that manner because that's how they would uh, go about uh, in, in different social uh, moments. So here we have Katina here on the right that uh, is talking about her experience in Korea, and then we have Jen also talking about experience you need to take a minute or so to read what they're talking about patricia as well um christian talking about what happened in, in japan etc 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 so let me let's move on to the next slide so you can get about but so what this means to me in general is before discussing cultural awareness or intercultural competence Culture is a concept that is important to bear in mind, right? But also we need to bear in mind that culture is a concept that is not static, that is not fixed, that is very, very, very complicated. I and mean, today we're going to use different concepts, but tomorrow other people can use different contexts. Everywhere you go and uh, whoever you talk to, concepts of culture are going to vary and are going to be totally different, right? But today uh, we'll talk about, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm here presenting some variations of, of, the, of, the, of this one. For example, the individual and collective ways of thinking, believing, and knowing of a group, right? In this case, I love this uh, specific definition because it's about groups. And I would say a country, it's a cultural group, an ethnic group is a, is a cultural group, an urban group is a cultural group. A group of teenagers is another group of uh, a cultural group. A group of teachers, a group of teachers from Tesla, Ontario. All of these are different types of groups, of cultural groups, right? A group of hip hoppers or LGBTQ people are a cultural group, senior refugees, or immigrants, etc., etc., and groups of um, people. So Matsumoto also talks about how culture is as much as in an individual psychological construct as it is a social construct. To some extent, a culture exists in each and every one of us individually as much as it exists as a global social construct. Individual differences in culture can be observed among people in the degree to which they adopt and engage in the attitudes, values, beliefs, and behaviors that by consensus constitute their culture. For some, Sorry, you said I'm going yes. to interrupt you. Yes. Uh, your voice is muffling a bit and breaking. Uh, mm. If you could just speak, uh, you know, a little at a slower pace, I think the problem would be resolved. Okay. okay. Is that okay? I'll, I'll, I'll oh, okay. 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 Thank you. So I will say, if uh, for some, if you act in accordance with those values or behaviors, then that culture resides on you. But if you don't share those values or behaviors, then you don't share that culture. So what this means is there's a group of people who share the same values, then it is considered that you belong to that culture. So while the norms of any culture should be relevant to all of the people with that culture, it is also true that those norms will be relevant in different degrees of different people. Other scholars have 
being more specific about culture and talks about the particular ways in which a group leaves out and makes sense of its given circumstances and conditions of life. So they talk about this idea of cultural forms, which are those symbols and social practices that express culture, such as those found in music, dress, food, religion, dance, and education. These are what we see on the surface, the reflections and the basis of how we judge people. In other words, these are the basis of what we call stereotypes. So in order to understand this better, I am posing what is called the cultural iceberg. I will show you really quick. If somebody else has seen this uh, out there, it's called the cultural iceberg and has been proposed by Edward T. Hall. What is what we see sometimes is what we don't see and sometimes we refuse to discuss so we can see here in the surface and the things that we see on a regular basis when we go to work, when we are in the street, we're in the train, etc. And these are the things that we not necessarily see until we actually dig deep into uh, deeper in the structure of this cultural iceberg. Sometimes the lessons that we prepare are located at the surface of this iceberg. And yes, although these are a good point of entry to this cultural differences, it's important to try to dig deeper. And I understand that this is based also in your level, the level that you're teaching, the context, and some of the circumstances. You can remain at the surface level, but always try to create a space for the students to discuss the deeper areas, or at least plant the seed of curiosity for students to expand. And I want, I want you to take this with you, the idea of planting the seed for students to expand, right? Because sometimes we do a lot of activities here at the top, you know, on the, on the surface of the iceberg, but sometimes it's difficult to talk about the things here. But if we do some of this and we plant the seed for the students to get curious and dig deeper at, at the, uh, on their own, then I think uh, our job has been, in a sense, done. Now, what is this thing that we call um, cultural awareness? There has to be an awareness of the self. We need to be able to know and understand who we are first before being able to understand others. Cross-cultural awareness involves uncovering and understanding one's own cultural condition, behavior, and thinking, as well as patterns of others. Thus, the process involves not only perceiving the similarities and differences in other cultures, but also recognizing the givens of in the, our native culture. So sometimes we forget about things that happen to our own culture and then we refuse to accept them in order to understand the other. So for Damon, what he is what he's talking about is understand our culture first and give examples of our own culture in order to understand the others. Cultural awareness is the sensitivity that individuals have towards the impact of culturally induced behaviors on language use and communication. So cultural awareness, keep that in mind, is the, the highlighted words that are here is the sensitivity. It's an approach to conceptualizing the kinds of knowledge, skills, and attitudes needed to undertake successful intercultural communication, which explicitly recognizes the cultural dimensions of communicative competence. And what else should I say here? At the most basic level, um, cultural awareness can be defined as a conscious understanding of the role culture plays in language learning and communication. The details of cultural awareness are conceived of and implemented in teaching practice in a number of different ways. Nevertheless, nevertheless Many of the approaches agree on the importance of a systematic framework for teaching cultural language together, in which the relationship between them is explicitly explored with the learners. So um, these, these people, Tomalin and Stemplesi, talk about the goals. What are those goals? So some, they talk about the idea of awareness of one's culture, awareness of others' culture, the ability to explain one's or other a cultural science points of view. And they also talk about this uh, ability, no? the ability to understand those beliefs, values, attitudes, 
on feelings from other cultures, while intercultural competence, and I will explain more in detail in a moment, is the ability to communicate effectively and appropriately in intercultural situations based on one's cultural knowledge, skills, and attitude. In other words, individuals are first sensitive to other cultural differences and then learn the, necess the necessary skills to communicate and behave according to specific contexts. As English language educators who work with diverse students, we need to learn and understand the various nuances of cultures. Our work is to translate that cultural knowledge into the classroom pedagogy. This webinar will discuss possibilities for classroom practices and experiences on how to set up the ground for meaningful, uh, meaningful hands-on lessons that raises students that cultural awareness in different topics that address things related to stereotypes, values, attitudes, and behaviors. So I'm going to give you a moment to write on the chat, what do you think is this person doing? Right, in order to understand this better, so so we need to understand what culture is about in order and we understand the culture by learning about some things that happen in those cultures. So what is this person saying based on your knowledge? Let's say a kissing, getting ready for a kiss, getting ready to kiss somebody. And yeah, getting ready, flying a kiss, watching TV. I like the cat watching TV. Look, arguing. I never thought about arguing. Say no. Surprise. Oh, this is amazing. Listening intently, paying attention, greeting somebody, questioning something. Surprise. Oh my God, this is amazing. Answers. Disagreeing. Show objection. What else? Okay. So you're right. It's in order to understand. What is happening in this situation? We must have certain knowledge. Knowledge of where is this coming from, right? So here I'm going to show you the answer. Ready? As many of you know, my background is Colombian. I'm from Colombia, right? So what this means is that the person is pointing. So instead of using the finger when being asked, "Excuse me, where is the museum?" Then you use your your finger to point. If you're in Colombia, a person may do this in order to point where the museum is. So also, if you are not aware of the situation, you will never know what this means. And obviously, the people on the right in the chat, no, none of them um, actually got it from, from the chat box. Now everybody knows. Now when you see a Colombian Blowing kisses, it doesn't mean that it's this disagreeing or discussing a topic or trying to give you a kiss. It just means that it's pointing where, where it is. And if you work at some point with Colombians, try this and ask the Colombians, excuse me, where is the book or where is the door or where is the washroom? And you will see how Colombians, some Colombians may use their mouth to point out. Here I have another question for you. What? So if that is the case, then what is about culture? What culture are we going to teach? Right, so we have like a lot of people saying, we need to teach the Canadian culture. Other people definitely did not the American culture. Other people are saying, we need to teach the English culture. Another no saying no, we need to teach the word culture. All right, I'm gonna publish right now. We have 22 people saying that we should teach Canadian culture. Other people say no, definitely we don't want to teach the American culture. Other says we need to teach the English culture, and most of the other ones are saying we need to teach word culture, right? But I'm asking this question because in my opinion, is neither nor. What is Canadian culture anyways? What is American culture? What is English culture? Is such a thing as English culture? Is there such things as world culture? Does it have to be one or the other one? I don't think so. It has to do with what are the different cultures that we're going to teach or explore. And usually not, when, I, when I talk about these topics with teachers, and I usually don't suggest to use the, 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 the word 
teach. Like I'm going to teach you X, Y, Z culture. But I, I encourage teachers to use the word explore. Let's explore about different culture. Let's explore cultures around the world, especially about those culture, the cultures of the students who you are having in your classroom. So in order to understand a little bit better, I'm shifting gears here towards what cultural sensitivity is and the, and the levels of cultural sensitivity as well, right? Biden in 1997 talks about cultural sensitivity, which means that students, sorry, which means that success, and keep this in mind, success is looking at a student's capacity to be center and understand the other's points of view about culture and foster successful communication and maintaining good relationships. In order to accomplish all of these, he discusses various levels of cultural awareness that I will not detail here, but I'm going to allow some time to ponder. Like, for example, these 12 elements are represented in order to build from basic understanding of culture, context in communication, to understanding of culture and languages in intercultural communication, meaning for English use in global settings. As we all know, globalization and internationalization are dominating concepts these days, as well as international mobility demands international or intercultural competent individuals who are able to move easily from one culture to another as an intercultural mediator. In other words, we may want our students to be those intercultural mediators, those who understand one two, or different cultures. So in order to do that, um, the Byron talks about different levels. And here we have level one, which generally refers to awareness of cultures, their role in certain communities, and how these can be compared to other cultures. Level number two refers to where are these cultural norms coming from? Who belong to this culture? If not a group of individuals with an array of experiences that are open for revision. And level number three refers to how these cultures interact and recognize the hybridity of different culture as non-static and non-binary constructs grounded on the possibilities for negotiation and understanding differences and commonality. The Byron states that the success of these levels of interaction implies not only an effective interchange of information, as was the goal to communicate communicative language teaching, but also the students' capacity to be centered and understanding the other points of view. So now I turn to this course, why? Why is it that do we want to do this? And what the aims are to pay attention to cultural awareness? So I'm going to talk about here, what are those goals of cultural awareness? And I decided to do seven of those based on uh, Ned Siki in 1998. So um, here we have number one, one of the main goals is to help students to understand the fact that people exhibit cultural condition behaviors. Another goal is to help students to understand that there are social variables and intersectionality that affect or not people's behaviors and communication. And uh, I want you to pay attention here to this word intersectionality, which is um, becoming trendy lately, and the idea that race, gender, religion, values, everything affects our students' behavior or how they perceive things or how they are treated or not in our classrooms or in their lives. And our goal as teacher educators is to help those students to understand where this is coming from. So goal number three is to help the students to become aware of the different societal conventions in different cultures, not only in, in Canadian conventions or in Toronto conventions uh, or in uh, our uh, PDSB conventions or link programs conventions, but in different types of cultural conventions. Number four, uh, help the students to increase their awareness of cultural connotations of words, phrases, and other devices that may interfere their communication. Like in the example I gave you earlier with the gestures, nobody knew about the meaning of the gesture until I told you that I was from Colombia and what it meant. And what happened, somebody in Colombia may perceive as, oh, look at that woman, or look at that man, he or she is blowing me kisses, and I don't understand why what this is happening. But now that you are aware of that, then that may 
uh, help out with the communication. Goal number five, help the students to develop an ability to learn how to deal with different cultural encounters in different contexts. And that's why we are preparing lessons to help them to, to whenever they find these cultural encounters, how they can minimize uh, the interference. Number six, help the students to get the necessary skills to locate and organize information about different cultures. And number seven, stimulate students' intellectual curiosity about cultures and languages and to be empathetic to other people. This is one of my favorite ones because I love this word of curiosity. Like I said in the beginning, we may not change students' attitudes or beliefs or actions towards different cultures, but if we could spark our curiosity towards those languages and uh, cultures, that would be a good start. Okay, so we have another question here. It's another um, question to analyze the goals for a moment. In the light of these questions, either on the chat box or to yourself, ask yourselves, where is this question coming from? What culture, or what cultures are more community oriented? I want to give you guys a minute on the chat to discuss what culture or cultures are more community oriented. I want to drink a little bit of water because it's getting hot in here. Yes, I mean more community oriented, less individualistic. You know, we have the idea that there are communities that are more individualistic and more collective. The reason why I'm asking this question is because Recently, I was in London with a friend of mine presenting, and then we were at a train station, and I was complaining to my friend, saying, oh, look at these, all these people here with all of those sorts of suitcases uh, trying to get into a train, and I don't understand why they are coming with all of these suitcases uh, trying to get onto a train. Well, look at the other guy just with one simple suitcase. That's great. That's very convenient. And my friend told me, you see it. The reason why this is happening, because you don't know, is that in our culture, and my friend is from uh, Ghana, she, she said, in my culture, what we carry on those bags is our community. And we are carrying gifts, we are carrying uh, clothes, we are carrying things that, are, that belong to our community, and we are giving them presents. Where the person, whereas the person who's bringing just one suitcase is, is coming from a community, or sorry, from a culture, is very individualistic and I bet he's only carrying his clothes and, and only the necessary things that he needs for himself but the person is may, may not be thinking about his entire community and that made me think and it struck me a lot to think about that how um, unaware I was of the idea until she actually told me and I was aware of this idea about community oriented Okay, so we have another question here, which is what culture is or are, or what cultures are expected to sugarcoat the language? So I'm gonna give you another extra minute to see <clears throat> which ones do you think uh, are the cultures that are sugarcoating the language? And you may wanna write, why do you people, why do these cultures may wanna sugarcoat the language? And the reason why I'm bringing this here today is because a lot of our students in our English programs come from cultures in which they do not sugarcoat the language, right? But for us, for North Americans, we may think that these people are rude, these people are respecting the teacher or respecting others, but the reality is, is because it's coming from a culture that we tell the things how they are uh, directly, right? So our goals as educators is sort of to mediate, understand where they're coming from, but also tell them that we live in a culture in which we not necessarily say things uh, directly because it may appear as uh, offensive. And then our goal as teachers is to teach them the skills to soften, quote unquote, so soften the language so they would communicate effectively. Yeah, Katina is keep talking about the sandwich feedback. I'm assuming that a lot of uh, ESL teachers, sometimes they teach them this, this sandwich approach to, to, to communication, right? And like I said in the beginning, uh, some of these topics 
and uh, uh, interesting because we are teach we although we are teaching them how to behave and how to deal in the, in our in our culture. Sometimes what happens is we don't take a moment or we don't take a step back and try to understand where our students are coming from. I have a question number three here, which is um, in what culture or what culture is normal to eat with their hands? And we're gonna I'm gonna give you an extra minute here to discuss what what culture is normal to eat with their hands. <clears throat> and the reason why I'm saying in what cultures is normal to eat with their hands is because I was I remember a while ago I was in one ESL class actually. And I remember this person brought a, in, a, in, a, in a plastic bag, listen to this, this person brought in a plastic bag food and started eating in the class with their hands. And to that, a lot of people, a lot of people were complaining that this is not the time to eat, that this is not how we eat, that you should eat some cutter leaves, some plastic knives, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens in the class, I remember the teacher took that moment to explain how in different cultures, first of all, there is no such thing as time to eat because they eat whenever they feel they're hungry. Second of all, there is not such thing as upperwares or, 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 or containers to carry the, the food. And third of all, there is no such thing as uh, plastic knives or spoons to eat. And then the, for these cultures, it's pretty normal to eat like this. And in, in, in that experience in that classroom allows students to understand uh, other ways of doing things, but also for the student under, understood at the moment that that was not the time to eat. And then if they wanted to eat, they would have to wait until it is break time or lunch time. So it's a it's a it's a it's a win-win situation here in which the student learn part of the culture and the other students part learn of the other cultures. So now let's move on to the idea of intercultural competence. So first of all, we just talk about uh, cultural um, awareness. So cultural awareness, imagine that it is just that you are aware. Now you know, right? But now we're moving on to what is intercultural competence? So it's the knowledge, right, of others. But it's the knowledge of self, but it's also the skills to interpret and relate the skills to discover and or to interact values, others' values, beliefs, and behaviors, and relativizing oneself. So not only be aware and remain silent, but to do something about it for the purposes of communication. <clears throat> so it looks successfully preparing language learners for intercultural communication. So that as we as teachers, we provide the skills, we provide the students with the opportunities to actually practice these ideas in the classroom or in real, in real life, so to speak. So is the ability to understand life, values, beliefs, attitudes and feelings from other cultures while intercultural competence, like I said, is the ability that we have to communicate effectively. So let us remember about the ability, acquiring that ability, learning it from somewhere. And some, some people say that this skill or this ability has to be explicitly taught, especially in language learning classroom. Sometimes teachers expect other students to just learn this on their own, but sometimes we have to develop classes and lessons specifically to target a specific thing that's, that have happened in the classroom or that you think they are necessary for your students. So when we teach with a cultural awareness or cultural competence in mind, we are teaching intercompetence, sorry, teaching intercultural competence skills. So when we teach with these skills, we need to bear in mind um, certain, uh, th these are the skills that I can come up with Deirdre, which is mindfulness. So mindfulness is the ability of being cognitive aware of how the communication and interaction with others is developed. It is important to focus more on the process of the interaction than its outcome while maintaining in perspective the desired communication goals. Cognitive flexibility refers to the ability of creating new categories of information rather than keeping old categories. These skills include opening to new information, taking more than one perspective, and understanding personal ways of interpreting messages and situations. Tolerance for ambiguity 
is the ability to maintain focus in situations that are not clear rather than becoming anxious and to methodically determine the best approach as the situation evolves. Behavioral flexibility is the ability to adapt and accommodate behaviors to a different culture. Although knowing a second language could be important for this skill, it does not necessarily translate in cultural adaptability. The individual must be willing to assimilate to the new culture or the, the ability to understand and learn from other cultures. And the last one is the cross-cultural empathy, which is the ability to visualize with the imagination the situation of another person from an intellectual and emotional point of view. So demonstrating empathy includes the abilities of connecting emotionally with people, showing compassion, thinking in more than one perspective, and listening actively. So now let's look at the popular iceberg again that we have here, uh, that I showed you in the beginning, and find out whether some of the activities that are out there foster cultural competence or cultural awareness, and which ones are located above the iceberg or below the iceberg. So I'm posing this just as a way for reflection for now, but also so we all have critical lens with us at all times when interacting with others, but also when preparing lessons. So I will give you a minute or a moment to describe on the chat box one activity that you think belongs above or below the iceberg. So use the chat to talk about, to discuss a one activity that's above the iceberg or below the iceberg that either you have done or you have seen. You said you can, uh, you can, uh, just a second, let me, ah, uh, yeah, there you go. You can drag it to the middle. Oh, thank you. I didn't know I was able yeah. to do Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. I was trying, what I was trying to say is that the, this iceberg that I showed you earlier refers to different types of uh, cultural ways of being. So there are those that are in the surface that we don't discuss um, uh, in depth, right? And then there's, there's, there's there are other ones that we don't discuss much. So I was going to say is that if you can give me one activity that we have seen or we have done that are located here in this area, right? or one activity that you have done in class or you have seen that is located at the bottom. So we see here mock interviews, body language, potlucks, humor, notions of modesty. Very interesting to know more about what you mean by modesty. Somebody's talking about the gestures, family values, and work ethic. I like this idea about work ethic, and I think that's one of very important, especially when coming to Canada, right? Gender roles and identity. All right. So before attempting to create lessons, I have developed these sets of questions to bear in mind at all times. When preparing lessons, the key is how my class is embracing difference and celebrating diversity. How can I engage my students in cultural understandings? How can I spark that curiosity? How can we build bridges? Uh, what is it allowed or not to talk about in the classroom? What is, it, what is taboo and what aspects of culture excite your students? And I think this one, Oh, I, that's great that I can highlight this. I like it. Um, what aspects of culture excite your students? Sometimes we, we think that students are not excited about things, but I invite you to go to your classrooms and talk to your students. What are the things that you want to talk about related to culture, to Canadian culture or to other cultures or maybe their own cultures? So here I'm going to talk about different classroom possibilities, and I know some of you may have already uh, done this in the class, some others may have, have not talked about these ones, but I'm just presenting what are the possibilities. And these possibilities not necessarily are the ones that I have done in my experience, but what I have seen other fellow teachers done in the past. So we have hello in different languages. If you have students from different nationalities, 
ask them to say hello in their language and other and others can practice the pronunciation. If they cannot practice the pronunciation, there are tons of YouTube videos that you can always go and get as a good source, but encourage students to practice and find similarities or differences, right? The second activity is called About Me. Describe who I am, where I'm coming from, my family, my friends, and the things that I like to do or not like to do describing physical attribution and using adjectives of personality. For example, last week with Rabia, we were talking about uh, one discussion about what your name is. Where is your name coming from or your last name? My name is Yesid. I didn't know until I came to North America and Arabic speaking people told me that Yesid with a Z and A in the beginning means like a, this big man, big person, big leader in the Middle East. That is not necessarily any uh, like a positive person, but he was a leader, etc. So I didn't know about this my own name. So if you can go into your classrooms and talk about um, your name and where your name is coming from, that would be great. Uh, another example is telling me about yourself. Write the story of uh, who you are, where uh, where you're coming from, etc. We already talk about body language and gestures. What does some gestures mean in different languages? Ask a student to present about different languages. Oh, I love this one. Does anybody know how do dogs sound in Japanese? Let's see, I'm gonna give you a few, a, a few moments here to, say, to see if you know how dogs sound in Japanese. I didn't know until I was preparing for this presentation. Let's see, it seems that Alex and Yana know Let's see if a couple more people agree with that. Look, Bow Wow, Cynthia, so really quick. There you go. See, this is a very simple game, see, very simple activity, but again, it's just to spark that curiosity for differences. And I didn't know, uh, to be honest, until I was actually preparing this presentation. And here I go, there is this website that you can go and find different posters, but this is the how other um dogs to a different language let me try to use the, the zoom in here look so i'm not going to try to attempt to pronounce in gav wow wow definitely the spanish is wow blaf one somebody will write and saying one wolf both ham bow etc 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 so if you go to this chap uh, this website you may want to find and uh, more although i will give you resources at the end don't worry about that in which you will find different posters you can actually print out these posters and put them in your in your classrooms more examples here of classroom possibilities are pre international cocktail parties present that you are in a party from different nationalities a student can perform their own roles or others a student can create roles based on some people that they know, etc. We talk about food festivals, talk about the food that is typically from my country, but it's also the food that I like. For example, I am Colombian and I like bandeja paisa, but I also la love Ethiopian food. Uh, another example, ambassador of my own country, you have to talk about your country or you can talk about other country that you have visited. When, and also if you, if you if there is a foreigner visiting your country what would you talk about good things or bad things about your country stereotypes about my country many people have done posters videos about the stereotypes of uh, people in from different countries and here i'm giving you an example as many of you already know uh, i am from colombia so everywhere i go people will immediately would say Pablo Escobar or cocaine or narcos or football soccer in this case or salsa music or a lot of people will relate it to Shakira or bandeja paisa you know this is the the beans and rice and egg and this is pork skin etc and interestingly enough that when I hear these things this does not represent me at all because I am vegetarian so this does not represent me at all. So I'll show you, this is what actually represents who I am. Because I live in Toronto, I am a Toronto Blue Jays fan. I'm also a, 
Chicago Cubs fan because I live in Chicago for 10 years. I don't like salsa music. I like more this, what we call uh, uh, tribe called Red, if you have heard about this, is electronic music from indigenous people of Canada. I like Indian food, I like Ethiopian food, but I do definitely miss the street food in Colombia. <coughs> right, so here is a yes, no question. Do you eat Canadian food, yes or no? Look at all the people saying, yes, I eat Canadian food. And I am glad that Nicoletta, a lot of people, uh, Claude, is asking the, exactly the question that I wanted to ask. What is Canadian food anyways, right? Like a lot of people, a lot of people are asking these questions. Like what is Canadian food? And this is one of the things that you want to, to discuss with your students. What is it American food? What is it Canadian food, right? Here's my question, what is Canadian food? So I'm gonna give you an, an extra minute to write this on your chat book. What is your favorite food really quick? We have, a, look, beaver tails and poutine is Canadian food. Pasta is Canadian food. So it's Canadian food related to the food that is prepared in Canada, therefore everything is Canadian food or Canadian food is that was born in Canada. Was it indigenous people's food, real Canadian food? Those are the discussions that you want to talk to your students. And also talk about the different food that you like. Look, rabia rice, walls, white salmon, butter chicken, pasta, maple syrup. Oh my goodness, all sorts of food is making me hungry right now. Classroom possibilities, proverbs. So if you want to talk about proverbs, one good example is this one. What do you call the tooth fairy in other countries? So I want to give you an extra minute or so. How would you call a tooth fairy in different cultures? I was talking to Ravia the other day and she was telling me that in her culture, there was no such thing as a tooth fairy, right? So I wonder, is there anything in your countries? And if so, how do you call it? and they start digging. The students can go back home and ask their parents, their grandparents, do we have this? And what is the history? Or tell them stories about the tooth fairy. In the meantime, I'm gonna show you how you say it in, in Colombia and in many Latin American countries, they call it El Raton Perez. Another example of classroom possibilities is, is transportation means of transportation, we have Kenya here, Matatu, and then in Colombia we have Colectivo, right? And you can keep talking about all these types of different transportation depending on where people are coming from. But what I'm trying to bring here is <coughs> dig into some conversation related to class and to classicism, ask questions in why people take these means of transportation and why other people don't take it. We, who usually takes these ones to go to work? And you may wanna hear uh, stories about people saying, yeah, my dad used to take this one at 5 in the morning. It would take two hours to get to work, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not discussion a little bit uh, below the, the culture, uh, the iceberg, the culture iceberg that I showed you earlier so to discuss classicism and class. This is um this is um this is a lesson that was prepared by a friend of mine, Ken, Ken Kendra Staley from the University of Colorado Boulder, who presented a while ago um in, in Toronto here for one presentation and she talks about a lot about stereotypes about gender roles and religions, right? And then she created this lesson that you will see there later on my website about how the different points of view and she uses this cartoon and asks sorts of questions in her classroom and what is the cartoon artist trying to trying to show and discuss about stereotypes etc 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 what the stereotypes in your country and making comparisons like between kenya and colombia the united states and canada etc and another classroom possibility we start digging a little bit to talk about racism for example so you have this um, photograph 
And then we ask questions to students, is this a welfare mom? Who is this kind of mom? And they start discussions and show them the other photograph. Well, this person is a mother, a daughter, she's an activist, a writer, but is also an indigenous person in Canada. And they start digging this, and why is it that we have come up with those um, stereotypes? What are our perceptions and what are our biases? Um, so we're getting more in depth a little bit here, and then there are cultural groups or subcultures who have been marginalized, and uh, teachers, you know, and our students can connect and take direct action. And this is a good example that I always bring in regards of culture is how students have created posters about bullying against sexual orientation. They have done uh, certain videos about the "That Is So Gay" campaign. Uh, other students take the posters and they have gone in in the pride parade with their schools and other students have been to church community center here in toronto and find out the more information and come back to their classrooms and talk about these sorts of things now i'm moving on because i want to share with you one specific uh, lesson that i created with a friend of mine uh, and this was based on how difficult or not is for people from other countries who come to Canada or to North America when it comes to dating, right? So when people from other countries come and they find it difficult to find romance. So this is so interesting. This is a work in progress. So our goal today here is to help the students to understand that there are social variables and intersectionality that affect or not people's behaviors and or communication. And the second goal is to compare romantic or non-romantic relationships from different parts of the world. And here our level is probably intermediate or lower intermediate young adult class. And um, I'm not gonna tell you necessarily what to do in the classroom, but what I'm gonna uh, help you today is what are the things that you can do in, in class, the teacher pair up the students and ask them to discuss these questions. And I'm gonna read them to you really quick. Um, is uh, how did your parents meet, for example? How did you meet uh, your current partner? What kinds of relationships are possible? You know, there are relationships like men, men and men, men and women, men, women and women, etc., etc. And um, what do teenagers do nowadays for dating? Do you date people older or younger than you? Where do you meet potential partners? Party, a bar, a school, speed dating? Who pays the bill when you are on a date? Have you dated a person from a different ethnic background of yours? What has been your experience? Have you used dating apps? Are there any dating apps specific for other countries? Tell us your experience. It's so interesting that in Toronto we have Tinder, but in Colombia they have one called uh, HI5, or they call it High 5 and so on and so forth. So, yeah, so these are some of the examples that you can go into your classroom and ask these questions about these dating costumes. Some of the students uh, wrote uh, some essays about this, others made uh, videos, and other ones uh, made some video blogs, and some others did interviews to other of the actual partners, actually. Uh, a few of the adaptations here, and at a basic level, like I said, created posters, cards, uh, these students made fans, fans in or comments about the difference between different relationships. Comparing, I mean, he, this is one example, comparing most men pay for the bills in many Latin American countries. Uh, an intermediate level would do interview with peers, family, friends, and made a report. Others created blogs. A uh, more advanced level created narratives of their experiences. Others created actual blogs, created voice thread videos, and using multimodality, etc. So, as a conclusion, I have three conclusions for you today. Educat educators must strive to create a fusion, fusion approach that unites both global and local and intercultural competence and skills that allow students to better navigate the intricacies of life. You know, when our students come into the classroom, especially when they're immigrants or refugees or from other countries, it is very, very difficult to understand how to deal with certain cultural things, not, not only in Canada in general, but specifically in Toronto or specifically from your school. So it's up to our, uh, us educators to design lessons that address those specific cultural issues. 
The second conclusion that I have is to account and recognize the different cultural differences students bring in the classrooms and celebrate diversity by creating critical lessons that challenge all forms of inequalities among different cultures. So in order to exemplify this conclusion in one of the link classes that I visited a while ago, I remember many students uh, were complaining because there was this person who for two or three days, this person was stealing their notebooks and their pens, like sort of like grabbing them and, and just leaving for two or three years. So people started complaining until somebody decided to ask or this person in their, in their native language what was going on and what was happening is because this person was coming from Africa in which they don't have many resources, they don't have notebooks or pens or colors, markets, etc. So this person was bringing these materials to her uh, class to give it to her children so they could actually have some materials to, to write or to draw, etc. And it was not until this happened that they opened the conversation about uh, resources in different parts of the world. And the last but not least conclusion that I have is to promote lessons that look at concrete real life actions that transform a students' lives and others. And like I said, we always can create a lesson that remains at a lesson level, but I understand that it's difficult, but as much as you can, how can we create the lessons that actually translate into uh, transform a students' lives and go into the real, real life as a live action uh, lesson plan? Um, so I'm gonna finish by now because it's almost uh, eight o'clock. And I know you might must be tired of me talking too much. So I'm gonna finish by now. And here are some of the references. And thank you so much. I will accept a couple of questions. I don't know, Ravi, how we're gonna do about questions here on the chat box, or uh, I know throughout the, our, my presentation, there may be some questions that I missed because I was uh, focusing here on the presentation, but please let me know how to proceed. Well, thank you very much, uh, you said. Well, um, yes, it's almost eight o'clock for us to time for us to finish, but um, anyone can stay back to um, uh, you know ask questions to you said. The room is still open. Uh, before um, we leave tonight, uh, I must thank you said for such a practical webinar. And uh, thanks everyone for being here. This webinar was uh, a best practices webinar, which is funded by the uh, which is funded by the Ontario Ministry of College and Trades, known as MCT. Um, so, um, well, uh, there are a few <laughs> upcoming webinars. Uh, just give me a second, and we'll be there. Yes. Okay, so our next webinar is next week. It's a, a Google-related webinar, and uh, it's about uh, Google's blog spot for ePortfolios and Classroom uh, Ecosystem. That's on Sunday, April 29th. And the next webinar is on May 27th, which is also a Sunday, uh, Simplifying Literacy Task Assessments. I'm sure we are definitely going to be interested in that so uh, please remember that uh, we, you will be sent a survey and please complete the survey uh, for um, uh, better performance next time and it helps our presenters and the team to improve um, the PD certificates will send will be sent out uh, following this webinar so please hold hold on to that um, if there are any questions that you would like to ask you said uh, you're most welcome. Uh, I had one question that Claudie asked, I think, and I'm going to put that here. Oh, where's yes, my... uh, I was going to say that, number one, I will provide this um, PowerPoint uh, that will be available, but on top of that, I have a two page of resources that you can go and find out more in details about what cultural awareness is, cultural uh, intercultural competence, and specific uh, classroom resources and activities. So I will add it to the, to the PowerPoint. So Ravi, I'll let me know if this is going to be sent out to the members or this is going to be posted somewhere. It will be posted on the TESA, uh, in the TESOL Ontario group and you can access it. This uh, uh, webinar is recorded. So you can access this webinar for the slides again. 
and uh, if you have missed any part you would re would you would like to revisit any part you can watch the video that will be available shortly great all right thank you so much yeah some yeah somebody was talking about uh, how do we do comparisons uh, as opposed to judging and i think in my opinion it is where you're coming from if you're coming with uh, with comparing with an honest heart and with a humble heart rather than a judgmental heart I think it is important to just start for, like I said in the beginning we start from our own and say where you're coming from you say well in my culture or where I was born or where I'm coming from we do these things and then you present the things that you do or the way you see things and then you say and there are other cultures in which they see it this way they also see it this way as opposed to, to pinpointing one specific culture so the idea is instead of saying this one versus this one is more like there are three or four or five or different ways of looking at the same topic and then some of those may be from the students background some others may not but like i said if you're coming from the from a good heart explaining it rather than in a judge, judgmental way and comparing various ideas of the same issue it may minimize a little bit the idea of being judgmental and i understand that there are uh, some things that we may agree or not but remember, I want to remind you that we are educators. We are not there to judge uh, other people's values or beliefs, but mainly to to, um, to sort of to mediate in between and teach them about the many different ways of seeing the same issue. All right. Uh, and uh, there is a question about if there is a, le there is a sample lesson plan. Uh, the one that I showed you today, it's a, it's a sort of like a sample lesson plan and you can just follow through the same idea of the lesson plan plus the ideas. But like I said, in the documents that I will give you, there are people who are specifically been doing this for a long time. So I, I don't have them on my own because I haven't taught for a while, but I, in, the, in the material that I'm giving you, there are links in which you can actually go and find out specific lessons related to this topic. Uh, yes, it, uh, if it's possible that you could email me your uh, PowerPoint yes. slides and yes. I can upload them on the group. Perfect. Oh, there's another great. question. Yes, yes. Uh, from Natalia. Right. How do you measure it? That's a, that's a good question. And thank you for asking that question because I do not like the word measure at all. I actually i am opposed to measuring men and to evaluations, standardized tests. I don't think there is a way to measure culture, but uh, what you can do is to uh, assess, so to speak. I don't like to use those words, but it's, it's, it's about how you see the progress in your classroom. Like when you're in a classroom with a group of people who did not understand many issues related to culture, and then at the end of the semester, you see a group of people who are engaged in learning about different cultures and different languages, then that's your measurement. Then you, then you see yourself, how your students have come to a point in which they understand the different issues, right? When you, let's say in the beginning, you have a, call, uh, a class in which people didn't know about the stereotypes, right? Now, where the stereotypes were coming from. But at the end of the year, you, under, you, you notice that your students now talk about the stereotypes and how not to judge people based on looks or based on color or based on belief, then that would be your measure. But I understand the question is coming to how did you evaluate these things? And I do not have an answer because I am not an assessment person. I don't believe in this idea of assessing people's outcome, but I'm more a person who likes more to, towards working in projects, activities that engage students and affects people's lives. And that's what I'm all about. Sorry, I didn't answer the question about the, the assessment piece specifically. Okay, there's another question uh, from Yana. Yeah. How do you okay. realistically deal with intercultural problems in your class, especially if the students are from countries that have very rough history or many? Yes, and there is the story, the, the, there is the idea of a uh, trauma. And like I said uh, in the beginning, it's it's hard because we as teachers have to be cautious, ca exercise caution. And, and, and analyze and evaluate our classroom, who are our students. And uh, because I have worked with my professor, with students who are coming from um, refugee countries or, or refugees from Syria, et cetera, they come with a lot of trauma and a lot of problems. 
And I would say in the beginning, probably not to address necessarily things that are personal, personally related to them, but address issues that are general, like general to everybody in the classroom, general to, to, to humanity, so to speak. And little by little, once the students are sort of coming out and trying to uh, give you ideas of where they are coming from, sort of to, to get their, their confidence, then you can start bringing those topics because I understand this is tricky, this is very sensitive, and it's something that doesn't not come overnight, but it's a process of your students getting uh, confidence with you. And this doesn't happen in one day or two days. It may happen in at least three months, six months, or even in a year. And once your students start coming out and uh, seeing you as a, as a peer, as a person who you can trust, they can start telling you their stories and coming out with uh, where they coming from. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, and Nodira has a question as well. Can you start, wait, can you start classroom activities that develop interculture and not just knowledge of the world is? Yes, that's a good question. I don't have anything on top of my head, but like I said in the document that I'm going to give you, there are people who have developed tons of activities to develop these intercultural skills. What I gave you today is mainly some of the, 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 the things that the possibilities that can be done in the classroom sort of to spark your curiosity to this and you can dig it into the documents that I will be sent out and you will see more details about these classroom activities to develop intercultural skills. Okay, thanks Vanessa. Good night. Thank you everyone. Uh, thank you Yesed for uh, all, uh, answering all these questions.